Just uh, a quick correction. It, it's not called anymore the Civic Engagement Club. Uh, the name changed to Community Engagement Club. And yeah, I do appreciate. Thank you very much for acknowledging that event. It was a great event then that we had on campus with our candidates for board. Yeah, well done. Uh, no other student trust. Uh, st no other trustees at this time. Any trustee reports to report out? Future reports? Any at all at this time that need to be brought to the attention of the board? None. Public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, and I'm going to read this very quickly for people. Uh, and I just read what is traditionally a total of five minutes we allocated to each subject unless extended by the board president. Uh, after receiving testimony, the, the board may recommend placing items on the agenda or future meetings or ask for a staff report. I do have, uh, and I'm going to ask, I have seven speakers on a multitude of issues. I'm going to ask if, uh, if it's appropriate with the board, if there's no objection, I'm going to take the five speakers that I have for the parking issue uh, that we can allow them to go first and cluster them together. So if we could, what we're going to do is, because there's a five minute limit, there's five speakers, that gets a little bit difficult to say anything. So what I'm going to do is if you can do it within two minutes, uh, as you come to the podium, please, uh, uh, your name for the record. And uh, at one minute, you'll just see me do this. Uh, and at two minutes, I'll do this. And I'll just say, if you could please you know, uh, conclude your comments. Uh, so at this time, I do have here for the five speakers on the parking issue, uh, Christine or Christina, however you pronounce it, Jerry or Councilwoman, however you want to pronounce that one, uh, Kelly, Don or Dom, and Richard. Those are the five speakers. You don't have to go in that order. It doesn't matter to me. But if you could please line up against the wall over here. That sounds a little intimidating, but um, it yeah. just moves <laughs> things along a little bit quicker. And so for the record, again, your name. Uh, and if you could have your comments in two minutes. And again, I'll, I'm not waving to you, and I apologize. We don't have, like at the city council meetings, you're looking at the official timer here. So again, uh, welcome. And your name for the record, please. I'm Councilwoman Jerry Shipsky. I represent the 5th Council District, and I'm actually a former trustee of Long Beach City College. Uh, although when I was a trustee, the surroundings weren't as posh and as nice as they're here. Um, I'm here to represent a number of very frustrated, angry residents who, after a period of eight years, um, are very upset about the fact that the input, the impact in their neighborhoods. I will say to you, um, Dr. Clark, I did come and talk to you. And yes, I did, sir. And in fact, several people came with me when we came to the board meeting. And we were basically ignored and said nothing. Never talked to you in regards to this subject. I, I'm sorry, I'm I don't sorry. remember that, but we did. Um, the bottom line is we did come before this board as well. And I do want to thank um, Superintendent Oakley because we've had meetings up, and also Mark Taylor has been extremely helpful. <clears throat> a couple of years ago when several of us did come to this board at the other building, um, when we talked we were told that with the construction of the new parking structure things would get better. And, and I took that back to constituents and unfortunately it has and it actually in many neighbors has gotten worse. And let me explain what has precipitated this. We did have a meeting in March, and actually it's 60% approval, not 70%. And what occurred was not only did the people from the surrounding neighborhood of what they call the four C's, but Lakewood Village people came and said, first of all, they were upset that a new group of constituents would get free preferential parking, when in fact they've had to pay for the permits. Then we got into a discussion about other things, the impact, it's not just, it's not just that they can't park, around their residential area. It is the litter, it's the loitering, uh, it is the sexual activity in cars, it is the drug paraphernalia that's been left in the neighborhoods. Um, and as I try to explain, as a former trustee, you certainly don't have control over what happens with the students. But they feel that the, the college as it's expanded has negatively impacted their neighborhood. And that's why they're here tonight. And I will tell you that um, it's interesting and I didn't time them to be here the night you raise fees. Um, but yes, it's true, you can't use government fees to pay their permits. No council member pays for parking 
preferential parking. I don't know why, where that came from. Cal State uses some of the ticket revenue to offset the cost of the preferential uh, permits. And so these residents, they will tell you their stories, but the bottom line is they need relief. They want the college to be a good neighbor. Their neighborhoods are, are pretty much exhausted about the impact, and we'd like to be able to see if there's something we could do moving forward. So I'll let them speak for themselves. Thank you very much. Next speaker, your name for the record, please. Uh, Richard Walser. Um, due to the time limitations, I'm going to go ahead and donate my time to Don. You, you know what? We, we, no, please, just go ahead and do your comments, and we don't start. Just He'll have his time to do it, so go ahead and make your comments if you want to. Um, well, uh, because I can't keep track of all donating time to everybody. It makes my life easier, too. This goes too. four minutes. No, okay. You have two minutes. So Go ahead. Um, I, I uh, second everything Jerry says. Uh, we moved into the house in 2008, and since then, the neighborhood has really uh, deteriorated. Uh, we have uh, just the other day found out uh, what was the underwear and condoms, used condoms in somebody's front yard. Uh, heard about all the drug paraphernalia, sex in the cars, the trash. Uh, all these strange people in our neighborhood uh, moved in there, thought this was the destination street. Or, you know, this you drive there because you live there. Instead, we have all these strange students all over the place. So I believe in what Jerry says, that you can find the dollar someplace. From what I've heard, you get $500,000 a year from the VA stadium, renting that out. You should use some of this money for us because in all the tens of millions of dollars, a million for technology, you should put a couple thousand over in our neighborhood. That's it. Thank you. Good evening, board. Um, appreciate some time talking to you tonight. My name's Don Hasselroth. I live on Clark Street. I've been your neighbor here for 20 years, and I've never met any of you, but it's good to meet you. Um, nice building you've got here. Uh, you've already addressed the, the bond measure money not being able to be used for outside uh, uh, uses. However, $747 million in accrued funding has to be accounted somewhere, and I think many of us want to know why the same money that we're being charged, $20 a year for every $100,000 of valuation on our property, is creating a problem that you won't even address or help us. I also have to wonder how 2000, in 2009, when Cal State University Long Beach had this problem, F. Alexander, F. King Alexander came to the, the, the table because he was embarrassed by the, by the uh, remarks that he found out from his uh, students and the residents, and he came forward and orders $18,000 a year to offset and subsidize uh, residential permit parking in that area. Um, it just seems smug to me, and I'm not even going to read my notes, but you're sitting here and you make an, and, and you go ahead and increase the parking from a dollar to two dollars, you double the parking, and the students won't even pay a dollar now to use the parking. And you don't even have any consideration of the impact that it's gonna have on the neighborhood. It's gonna double the, the uh, problems that we already have that we've been trying to address. And so, no offense, but I mean, I don't really think that you're in touch with the neighborhood at all. I've got three dogs. <laughs> don't take my time. I've got, I've, we, have, we have three dogs. I put, I put $3,000 in fencing around my house to contain my dogs. I'm not comparing your students to dogs by any means. But fences, you've all heard the terms, good fences make good neighbors. And that's basically what we're asking you to do. Split the cost to help us put up a fence so you can contain your students within your campus and I'll keep my dogs in my yard. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name's Christina Leah. I live in the neighborhood above Harvey Way. We already have preferential parking on our street, and the students still occasionally park there. However, they sit in their cars, which is more troubling to me than just parking a car and leaving it. I'm going with uh, us watching the increase in crime. We're going, is that a student? What are they going to do when they get out of their car? But I have three suggestions. Um, President Oakley, you sounded like you were um, interested in other ways of mitigating this. Do you know that you don't even have enough parking on your campus here? Some students are late because they have a parking permit, but they can't find a parking place, and they, so they drive into various neighborhoods to go find parking, and that makes them late for class. How about rearranging your schedule so that you have more balanced 
student population on campus at all times. Um, instead of having a lot of classes meet at one time, maybe you could rearrange your schedule to have those, some of those classes meet at other times. For example, you hardly have any classes on Fridays. This campus is practically deserted on campus. You could move, you know, move 10 or 20 classes just to, just to Friday. Um, another option would be to find out what Cal State Long Beach does with the bus um, Long Beach Transit because their students, once they go there, their student body card gives them free bus transportation. Our son, who was attending here, is now over at State College. He gets on the bus stop right here by the college. Why drive your car? It's free going on the city bus. That will also help the environment just get tons of cars off the road. However many students, you know, figure it's easier to um, just take the bus, that would be good for them. Um, I also have a comment for the city and for those of you, some of you may be interested in running for city office. Um, the preferential parking permits supposedly are cost neutral to the city, but I don't know why you can't make that program be so the pass is good for two or three years so that the price they pay lasts for a longer term. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Kelly Garrios. Uh, I live on 4500 block of Whitewood Avenue in Lakewood Village. First, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak and I just wanna thank uh, Councilwoman Shipsky for organizing this. Uh, I appreciate that, Councilwoman, thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's um, the whole thing that started this is, uh, I don't want to call it a lack of a response from the community college. Uh, the reason the community and the neighborhood are going toward the preferential parking, because they felt that they're not getting anything from the community college. When you go that route, you got to get 66%. Not only that, it's getting community members pitting against other community members. We're supposed to be a neighborhood. We're supposed to be close to each other. This situation is creating an impact, negative impact on community because person that live next door to another person that don't, don't want to pay and the other person just want to relieve themselves from the issues that were brought to your attention, say that they're going saying, okay, I'm gonna pay. So now they're just fighting each other. Why and why not? This shouldn't be done that way. Please work with the city, work together. You know, we, we, we went to the moon for crying out loud. We can resolve the parking issue. Just please work together and resolve that parking issue for us. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. All right, those are all the speakers for, I, sorry, no. Chair recognizes Trustee Clark. Yeah, I would, I'd like to make a motion. I wanted to hear the speakers and and I'd like to refer this to the president and the staff to take, make a review and then to refer it back to the city council. So we'll have this as another official item and we'll notify you so you can be here at that time because I, I am concerned about the district. I've lived here and I've been your representative for 16 years and I did not have one phone call. I'm sorry to say. So okay. it, it doesn't need to have a motion. It's just if you were requesting, there's no objection to the chair Thank you or very other much. members to have the president superintendent, as, as you have been doing, but continue to do so, working with the city manager's office. I'm sorry, Trustee Bowen, are you looking at me? No. Just, you're looking at me. Okay. Other members of the board? Thank you for making me feel very old because I believe the first um, preferential parking uh, was when I was on the city council. It was, I, and I can't remember the history of it, but I, I believe the first, the first one ever done was up in the Bixby Knowles area because I was on the council a long time ago. So I didn't realize it was now 66% of the vote, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to get the issue resolved for all parties. Other questions at this time? Yeah, just uh, what, what, Chair recognizes Trustee Otto. Thank you. You know, I, I, uh, I hear the concerns of the neighbors that, uh, that they believe that there are parking impacts in their neighborhoods and that, um, and that you'd like to make sure that something's done about that. I also understand that there's a process in place. It's really a city process in the sense that it's run by the, uh, the traffic engineer for the city, that what he says in his uh, letter to the community is that, um, 
I believe the best course of action is to seek residents' opinions directly by mail. Enclosed is a pre-addressed stamped postcard for you to complete by checking the box indicating your support or opposition to temporary pref preferential parking on your block. Your participation in this survey will, keep, will, keep, will be key to us determining how best to proceed. Please complete the postcard and drop it in the U.S. mail by March 31st. So I'd like to encourage you to do that. I know that this isn't going to solve all the problems uh, and that the college, I guarantee you, will continue to work with the neighborhoods as we've tried to do over the years to solve whatever problems that there are, but the cities, th this is basically uh, a city process uh, and we can't do this because it's city run and it's really governed by the city council and the traffic engineer. I think that, and, and then what the, what the, the uh, Dave Roseman, the city traffic engineer says uh, at the end of his letter is that I anticipate that I will be writing to you again probably in mid to late April with a summary of residents' responses so that they can move forward on this. In the meantime, the college can continue to work with you to address these problems and see what it is that we can do. Uh, Councilwoman Shipsky acknowledged that the college can't spend these funds, uh, uh, that, that it would be probably against the Constitution as an unauthorized giving of public funds uh, and against the education code as well. And I, I wish that was different, but that's what it is. Um, and so, but that doesn't mean that we can't look for alternative solutions, that there aren't other ways that we might be able to address this. And so uh, maybe in the middle of April, once the surveys have been calculated and the, the, the anxiety in town has died down a little bit, uh, we, can, uh, we can make some real progress on this. All right, quiet, please. Quiet, That's, this, this isn't a city council meeting, it's a community college meeting. Chair recognizes Trustee Aranga. Uh, another aspect uh, that I heard uh, from concerns from the residents is it's a public safety issue. Um, students are overstaying their welcome in the neighborhood, uh, obviously in the loitering and, and other activities taking place as well. Perhaps also a President Eloy, a Superintendent Eloy, if you can also include uh, a review of our policing uh, activities in regards to our police department and security. Uh, perhaps expand the radius of their patrols uh, to maybe include some of those neighborhoods. And uh, while they might not be parking control uh, responsibilities for them, at least uh, patrol the areas in those areas to ensure that uh, nothing illegal is taking place and that there's some uh, kind of uh, surveillance that's probably uh, in those areas. Because as we know, uh, when there are patrols, uh, people tend to uh, do the right thing and leave. So I mean, we might be able to look at that to see if our police department uh, security can uh, look into the possibilities of expanding their radius of patrols to go a little bit beyond the borders of just the, the community college and into those areas so that the, our residents can feel secure and safe. Uh, we'll certainly look into that. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, our police is the city's police. We contract with the Long Beach Police Department, which is governed by uh, the, the, the city. Uh, and uh, any issues regarding patrolling are issues that are directly related to the city and the city council and the police chief. But we will certainly work with our, our uh, representatives from Long Beach PD to see what, if anything else, that uh, could be done to uh, help uh, patrol in those neighborhoods. All right, no other comments, members of the board? Uh, thank you all. If, if you would like to, to leave, uh, you are welcome to, or you want to stay for these last seven speakers, you can also do that. Uh, the speakers now, this is on a non-agenda items. Uh, we're going to start with Karen Roberts. If you just leave quietly. Thank you all very much for your patience all sitting through this meeting. Karen? Good evening. Karen, just, I'm just hold one minute. Wait till they move out. Yeah. 
All right. If you could just please exit the uh, boardroom, please. People in the corner, could you please? Councilwoman, could you take that meeting outside, please? Be respectful to the speaker that we have now. Karen, Karen Roberts. I'm Karen Roberts, president of the Part-Time Faculty Association. Good evening. Um, I wanted to uh, draw your attention to a report that came out in 2014 called the Just-in-Time Professor. I, I emailed a copy of this report to um, Eloy. And um, this was a report that was done by the House Committee on Education and the Workforce Democratic Staff. Um, and as far as I know, this is really the first national report that's being, been done on uh, part-time faculty in the higher, um, higher education. Uh, what I have distributed to you, um, or what I gave to Jackie to, to distribute to you, um, is actually a graph that's from page three. And the data shows in this graph that there's been an increase in the hiring of contingent professors in all institution types. This is nationwide. Uh, in 1969, the number of professors working part-time was just 18.5%. The number of part-time faculty has grown by more than 300% from 1975 to 2011. I think probably the most significant thing about this report is that it also shows um, how the entire academic workforce has undergone a significant change. Um, over the past several decades. Um, one of the things that we definitely see is that the tenure-track college professor with a stable salary, firmly grounded in the middle or upper middle class, is becoming rare. I mean, I think we see this with our own numbers of full-time faculty um, in the report, that 270, and of course, I know more are on the way, but we're still very much out of balance. Taking the place of the tenure-track college professor is contingent faculty. We are, of course, non-tenure-track teachers, part-time adjuncts, or in some institutions, graduate instructors, with no job security, working from one semester to the next, working at a piece rate, with few or no benefits across multiple workplaces, and far too often struggling to make ends meet. Um, in 1970, adjuncts made up uh, about 20% of all higher education faculty today, they represent half. I think, you know, as we, as we look at our own part-time faculty, we certainly see significant changes in that, you know, part-time faculty used to be the person who maybe had a full-time job and then came to teach at the community college or uh, a Cal State system one night a week or you know, one or two classes here and there. Today, the problem is that too many contingent faculty are freeway flyers. And I think that's one of the problems we're having in, in this college is that a lot of, I'm hearing from a lot of part-time faculty who are comparing their conditions at this college with other conditions um, along the 405. And asking us, you know, why are the salaries so much less here? Why do we not have access to health benefits? Why don't we have seniority or any kind of rehire rights? Just some things that would help to create a stable workforce. And um, I know that I've talked about this before, but I think what we're seeing now is that this is a significant trend nationwide. And one of the things that this, this study is showing is that there are many part-time faculty who are living near the poverty level, um, unfortunately. So I wanted to bring this to your attention. Um, I will be happy to email you all a copy of um, this report. It also talks a little bit about um, the report on CNN. Uh, I think that was September 2013, about the plight of the adjunct faculty. So we're working to improve conditions here. We are in negotiations, and as long as I'm president, I'm committed to continue that work. Thank you for your time.
Thank you. Next speaker is Kenneth Jones. Kenneth Jones regarding veterans education. And just so someone knows, uh, Thomas Hamilton will be the next speaker after Kenneth. Afternoon. I, I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to speak. Normally, um, and, and normally I hate speaking about issues like this, but um, I have to sit back and I think about all the sacrifices that, um, that I've made, that all my friends have made for this country. And um, I just, I'm, I'm just gonna lay it on you like this. Um, for so long, I have struggled to get my point across. Now I stand corrected. We students have struggled. Every day is a challenge. That I, every day is a challenge that I must overcome, whether it be in remembering my own children's names or trying to fight for the rights of veterans in our country. We endure life problems every day. We fight for freedom every day. It seems like the values that I grew up with as a child, as far as pledging allegiance to the flag or singing America, my country tis of thee. We try to, um, I feel that every day our, ex our very existence as free Americans are being challenged. We try to be diplomatic. We try it your way we, with no prevail. Every day more and more men and women of our armed forces are turned away from jobs and oh yes, education. The, closer, the closure of our trades was a heartfelt slap in the face for the brave servicemen and women who suffer from post-traumatic stress, depression, suicide, everyday real issues that I myself cope with every day. Because they had nothing to look forward to, um, to a question was asked to me, why do you go, why do you go for more, why do veterans go more towards the trades? Well, I can answer that. I can answer that for you. We are aviation mechanics, diesel, communication techs, medics, carpenters, whatever the field, these are vital roles in the military and our economy as a whole. Education is our salvation from lives, oppressions, and if we can't have this freedom that we fought for so hard for our, and we lay our lives down on the line for this great nation, well, we live um, this great nation that we live in, I feel like that we failed. And I feel like this nation has failed us. So I call on every veteran, student, not just in the state, but throughout the nation, a call to arms for education. Let us get our lives back. Thank you. Thomas Hamilton. And that'll be followed by uh, Marshawn Frazier. Good evening, my name is uh, Thomas Hamilton. I'm the AFT president here at Long Beach City College. Good evening, President Oakley, President uh, Kellogg Board of Trustees, classified members, students, faculty members, and guests. The full-time faculty have a master's agreement with the city college. Part-time faculty has a master's agreement with the district. And the classified employees also have a master's agreement with the district. And 90% of the time and on the whole, the majority of the time, these contracts or master agreements work. And when they don't, there's rules in place in order to correct them, fix them, or to regain accountability with them. Where I come from, there's two ways to judge a man. Let me step back. And President Oakley, you have to bear with me with this. I'm gonna have to be a little political right here. Where I come from, there's two ways to deal with a person. You sit down, you talk to them face to face, eye to eye, work out your agreements, do a handshake, and you have an agreement. Your word meant everything. 
Board of Trustees, I have some words for you. It's Administration Regulations of Institutional Code of Ethics 3008.2. Definitions and standards of ethics, ethical behavior is often defined as right of good. Behavior as measured against commonly acceptable rules of conduct for the society or for a profession. The ethical person is often described as one who is fair, honest, straightforward, trustworthy, objective, unprejudiced, and equitable. The consistent exercise of integrity is the cornerstone of ethical behavior. And when I look over these different ethics that has to deal with the college that's supposed to be enforced by the Board of Trustees, I don't see anywhere in any of the documents where it says that managers are exempt. I know that we're all busy doing different jobs and sometimes we miss things. The Munch of Marf is just about gone. We had Fat Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, we're in the middle of Lent. March Madness is mad upon us in another three weeks, we'll have Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And in addition, Long Beach is in an election time. And I know that President Kellogg, you like details and everything else, and I know you've been busy as far as with your campaign. Mr. Otto, I know you want us to come fly with you. I have sent you all memos with major concerns and issues. We has, and as of today, I've only met with one. Mr. Yorongo, I appreciate you taking the time and effort and energy to sit down with me and discuss those major issues and concerns that we have. I understand that all of us are busy, but it does not allow you to forget or dismiss the current jobs that you have as far as like with the college. So before we take off, let's pump the brakes and get our feet back down on the ground. So you say, Thomas, what do I want? And it's not what I want, it's what we all want. We want you to do the job that you swore that you do when you were requesting the seat that you are now currently sitting in. Because if you don't, what message do you send us? You have a fiduciary duty to perform for yourself and for all of those that's in the audience tonight and for the students at LBCC. And so in closing, I have one final message. You can't expect accountability if you're not gonna be accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Marshawn Frazier. And that's going to be followed by Ann Engel. Good evening. My name is Marshawn Frazier. Been up here a couple of times. Kind of remember Mr. Oakley and Duranga. Duranga with some of his comments, and Oakley with the famous middle finger to me. Appreciate all that. Well, I hear all this talk about classes being taken away, uh, math and reading for the PCC campus. And what you guys' opinion, what you guys think is right for, which I don't know where you guys get off your opinions count. It's about the students in the community that I was born in, Long Beach, California, not East LA, not Lakewood, not none of that. I just recently moved over to Bixby Nose six years ago. Um, I was riding a bike with the kids down the street and I seen a, a little councilman poster with Yoranga's name. I seen Otto's and I'm not sure if I seen Kellogg. And my kid remembered uh, Yoranga's name. And he said, Dad, he's running. And he's running for councilman in our neighborhood, huh? I said, oh, he definitely won't get our vote, for sure. He will not get mine. And I said, Otto, for sure, would not get mine. You know what? Mine. I'm going to stop and you there. Definitely, no. Oakley would not get mine. Talk, well, my community, talk to the subject first of matter. all, do not approve no, of anything I'm you guys stop got you going there. on you here. Keep talking. And what you guys and are doing keep talking as is well. not you American, and it's not the way we get down here in Long Beach and in other talk in any other community. Matter. You guys will not get away with this, and I will make it my business to make sure that you guys will be recalled. Every single last one of you guys. Doesn't matter. Now what you're speaking about.
Can we ask him to be removed, please? No, I'm sorry. It's not the subject matter at this time. All right. Next speaker, please, which is Anne. And I'm going to remind everyone that uh, how, how meetings work is where people, it doesn't become some type of a rally where events like that take place. That's inappropriate. Uh, we're doing the business of the college. We don't allow political comments like that. Uh, it's not to the business of the college. So, And you get to follow that one. I'm sorry. Um. Good evening, board members, uh, fellow Long Beach City College associates, and whatever community is left. In 2002, a good friend of mine that lives in Lakewood and is an amazing math professor graduated from Long Beach State. She explored the local community colleges to see which she would like to work at and apply to. She was surprised at the difference in the pay scale that Long Beach paid its faculty and didn't even apply here. She applied at Cerritos in Cyprus and was hired at Cyprus. I've heard talk from the administration and the board of hiring the best and the, the brightest management. And the pay packages for management at LBCC support this goal. But unless we consider that it's also important to have the best and the brightest faculty and classified staff at this college, we will be on shaky foundation. And if we are not looking for the best and the brightest faculty and support staff, are we really thinking about the students? Because we all know that the people that they interact with the students on a daily basis are the faculty and staff. Although the district has started hiring back some staff since the layoffs and the reductions, Many are still in positions that aren't whole. I know we have already lost some great classified staff because their positions were reduced from 10 months of work, from 12 months of work to 10 months of work. Many people can't survive on a 10-month salary, especially a classified salary. Many of the new staff positions being offered are less than 20 hours a week without benefits, and some of those are even 10 months. I can't imagine these jobs will draw the best and the brightest. They will draw the desperate until something better comes along, and they leave, and then we start all over. The Human Resource Department is hiring more staff. Amongst the reasons is to keep track of all the various personnel shifting that is going on throughout this institution. We have many more student workers, limited term employees, adjunct professors, contract workers, and interns than we have ever had at this college. That's a lot of turnover, a lot of recruiting, testing, and hiring for someone that will be gone in six months to a year. And now the LBCC classified that have already been downsized and are already short staffed need to keep training new people as they come and go. This is not an environment that lends itself to efficiency and stability. This is not a sturdy and solid foundation. And I bet the students notice. I hope this administration and this board can firm up its commitment with faculty and staff to create the strong foundation that this college deserves. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be heard. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> Next speaker, and I apologize, John Kincaid, followed by Anthony. John, as you're walking to the podium, you put two cards in, but you, you have five minutes. Uh, it's, you still have five minutes. I want to talk about uh, the disillusion, the lies that goes on in, in student government with our student director and student health. We're told 
that we're supposed to do things by honor and learn all kinds of things. But how can you learn something when you have a director that misleads the students and lies to the students or has staff do that? 2013, in April, Miles, who's acting at the a coordinator at the time, misled the students in the culture affairs meeting a number of times and was pointed out that you were lying. Miles said that uh, it was in her, in her manual, which it wasn't, and I knew this because I read their manual, and uh, I challenged it on that, and there are some uh, ASB members that was there at the meeting that's here today present. Now, Miles had no idea that I sat on the Constitutional Committee a number of times on the ASB. Miles said that she would show me in her manual and her desk that it's her right to pick who's a gallery speaker, when and where. Other students spoke out on her, what she did the before, and she denied she ever did this in front of everybody to their face. Now, she was gonna show me these, these, these uh, saying in her manual, which she never did, but during the meeting, somebody gave me our bylaws and our constitution. I highlighted it, showed it to Miles, Miles got quiet, didn't want to show me the manual in her office no more. She went to Anita, and they cocked up this story that I was uh, disruptive behavior. The only thing I did was corrected her, told the students the truth, proved it, and she got caught in a lie. Next thing I know, they want to suspend me. I did not take the letter. Because I ask, I want a witness. I'm told I can't have a witness. I ask why? Under confidentiality. I said, I waive that. You can't waive that. Why not? No answer. I ask, show me a name of authority, a policy, a regulation that says this. Couldn't do that. She went to go call Anita. I waited 25 minutes. Still couldn't do it. I asked the Culture Affairs, I'm sorry, uh, Club Senate President at PCC to come over to witness this. I said everything that the person she sent over to give me this letter was Sylvia, one of her uh, staff members, uh, to be about this letter. Now, I repeated everything she said in front of that president. And she said she couldn't repeat it, but she could but he could watch me get this letter, which I never took. From there, they saw me for the whole semester in campus and in meetings all over the place. A student had to go and talk to them, and two of us went with her. She was told when we got there, we couldn't go in to talk with, go in with her, but yet the other people could come in and talk. Now, from there, I came in the student union one day. Miles came over and told me I can't be in there because I was served twice a certified letter. I asked to show me proof. Couldn't do that. Got mad. Next day I know, the police came in there. There was witnesses to this. They spoke up and said things to him. Anita showed up and Connie Sears gave the Kansas police a, a, a letter. They asked me to come out, Kansas Police. John, I said, you have sure. one, one more minute. And from there, it went worse. Now, two, two weeks ago, I was in jail for three, for three days for trespassing. I'm alumni, ASB, and a college student alumni with two associates and a certificate. I was invited to a meeting because I was helping out with an event. I did three days in jail for a bunch of lies. Things was made up. I, I, I know with, with, with nerve damage in my left eye, the things that happened. I had to lay on a bed in jail that I was told by the other inmates that the person that just left had HIV. John, if you could please conclude your comments, please. This college has a long-term of doing this. Dr. Peterson, over the years, you, me and you had a number of talks 
and other students about Anita Gibbons for the last two or three years. And nothing's never been done. All right, John. Thank you. Anthony. Also on education for veterans. You have the last word. Hi, board. My name is Anthony Lassie Mishapur. I am a veteran, although I look young, but I have served in the military in the United States Marine Corps. The um, only reason why I came to the school, I came to school back in 2003, right after recruit training. The only reason why I came here because I was in, uh, interested in automotive. Out of all the schools that I've been through, Cypress, Whittier, Rio Hondo, I heard Long Beach City College was the best one out of all of them. I even asked a person that actually lived down here that was in recruit training with me regarding the um, education here. He said it was by far the best, so I came down here, took a look, and decided to enroll. I enrolled here for two years before I went back into, uh, I was in the reserve, so before I went back into active duty, it was this around the time of 2004, 2005. And during that time, my education was postponed. I went to Iraq, came back, and I still found out that Long Beach City College was still offering the automotive service program. So I took the automotive service program, spent two years of my time uh, finishing the program, which was a great program, considering the teachers, the way how they taught it, all the students, including the project. I also went into welding. I talked to the teacher at welding and machine class schools and all the various trades of the school. All of them were very good. My knowledge were very, very exceptional. So a lot of students that would ask me, or a lot of veterans of my former Marines or soldiers that would ask me regarding their education, where would they decide to go? I would refer them to the school to the fact that I know for a fact that my education here was very well. Over the past few years since I've been here, um, I came here on and off between uh, 2008 to currently today. I noticed the school's been uh, changing that it's been having some programs being established and some programs being ended at, at the um, current currently right now. So as of right now, I know that the machine shop school, which is a great class, has been ended as well as far as the welding was ending too. And as far as the aero, uh, aerospace program and the automotive, auto body program was ended as well. Those are the few programs that I actually recommend to other students because the thing is in the military, where, whether they have prior MOS, is a, for example, myself, I was a lag gunner. If you don't know what lag gunner is, it's a low altitude air defense. I, in other words, I shoot down planes. Coming back from military, obviously there's no occupation to shoot down planes. I either need to be in space, space program or other various aeronautic programs, which I am not familiar with. So my only job in the military was to shoot down planes. Obviously, in the real world, you can't shoot down planes. You can be considered, like they said, a terrorist. So a lot of military personnel, like myself, will decide to figure out what they want to do. I, for example, like automotive, like I stated earlier. So I decided to take the automotive program. But over the past, like I said, over the past few, few years, it's been declining. So Veterans that come back here to the States, they have some PTSDs. Thank God for myself, I don't have any. But I have friends, I have friends that also passed away, or friends that dealt with it. And then sometimes, they're, um, it creeps up on them. I have a house outside the neighbor, he was active duty. He was in the radio, he was in ra uh, radio communication. He was in a fire, few fireflies, but the thing is, I also recommend here to come here to take the automotive program because I know, in fact, he wants to, to work on his vehicle. But as time progressed, I found out that re this year, the program is going to be ceased to exist. I found out last year it was going to cease to exist, but it was, that, but it was going to be continued. So I told them to come back here because this is by far the best program. As far as for veterans concerned, the veterans, I found out that the really, the second reason I came back here because I know this school is very friendly toward veterans. All the other schools, yes, they are friendly toward veterans, but a lot of uh, other, other veterans from the branches do recommend this school. So that's one reason why I do came here. And as a person in the armed forces, they are very prideful where they go. They don't say too much. When pushed back against the wall, yes, they will fight back. But when told what to do, they would do it and end up story. I'm just staying here, saying, see, we could still have these few programs extended or haven't stayed because of the fact that when they come back, they have something as a trade to come back into. Because when they come back, there is no, no one telling them how to get, to, get from point A to point B telling them what to do, and such and such and such. Only reason why I have this opportunity is because I'm a reservist. I, I served in the Marine Corps as a reserve, so in, in fact, I was able to one, do- One minute, Anthony. Sorry. All right. I was able to do both 
active, active duty during my part time and serve as, you know, civilian. When a lot of active duty Marines, soldiers, airmen, seamen come back from their active duty status, they have no clue what they have to do. So as a veteran, I would tell them to go use their veteran benefits to go to school because in that way they can, they can learn their trade and they'll better themselves and far as well as go, go for a career because like I said, um, like some, um, some other people say, everything in this world is not, uh, everything, is, everything has a fate. So if you're fated to do, go to that school, you're fated to go to that school. But as um, what they would say, not everything is written in stone. So for them to have to decide using the veterans, veterans um, benefits, which they do have, they could go to this school for the education as well as have better teachers, which are currently here, teach them and excel at their education and excel at their skills. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. No other speakers. Uh, there is no need for an additional closed session. Uh, so at this time, without objection, uh, this meeting of the Board of Trustees is adjourned to our April 29, 2014 meeting. Thank you all very much for attending. The meeting is adjourned. Good night. <laughs>